Uh, House File 3377, um, Area Mission. Please tell us about this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. House File 3377 requires the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency um, to require facilities with air quality permits. One minute. I need to move the bill. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm going to move the House File 3377 be referred to Environment Natural Resource Finance Division. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, House File 3377 requires the PCA to require facilities with air quality permits issued by the agency to increase the frequency with which air emissions are physically measured. Um, it also requires records of indirect measures of emissions to be sent to the agency monthly. Um, one of the concerns that we heard from a lot of people, so first of all, I think a lot of the general public doesn't know um, that a lot of our regulatory processes, particularly with MPCA, re rely on businesses self-reporting. Um, so relying on businesses to, to present the PCA with um, accurate data on, in this case, their air emissions. Um, the case of Water Gremlin um, brought up a lot of issues in this area, and I'm just going to walk through um, a few things. You don't have the stipulation agreement in front of you. It's like 30 pages long, but I'm going to walk through a couple things that came up in the stipulation agreement between PCA and Water Gremlin um, that indicate a need for something more than what we currently do, which is essentially um, go to a facility once in a while and then look at rely on paper records that the company is providing outside of that. Um, so I think one thing to understand is that um, the PCA had really no independent data um, about conditions at Water Gremlin. So they were relying on um, on the on the um, the regulated party, which is Water Gremlin, on um, their records and document documentation to ensure compliance with permit conditions. So just one example from the stipulation agreement. Um, the MPCA relied on uh, VOC performance test and water gremlins maintenance and rebuilding as justification for the equipment's capability, this is pollution control equipment, um, to operate above the required 95% control efficiency and included operating and record keeping requirements in the permit. Um, they had several issues uh, across several years with breakdowns in this pollution control equipment. Um, and over a course of several years, they went out and inspected um, and they never really discovered that there was anything wrong with the equipment um, because, again, they're relying on the company to tell them when they're experiencing issues. Um, they also, um, when the, uh, when Water Gremlin was, um, when PCA and Water Gremlin were having conversation around um, irregular, irregularities in information that they were receiving in 2018, um, in the summer of 2018, uh, Water Gremlin provided some information to, to PCA that was concerning. Um, and at the September 20th, 20, 2018 meeting, Water Gremlin was unable to produce records detailing whether or not their pollution control equipment was operating every day prior to July 22nd, 2018. So we're relying on a company um, that's supposed to be keeping records and hadn't been keeping records on whether or not their pollution control equipment um, was, was operating every day and what, how well it was operating. So that's one example. Um, there are several other examples in the stipulation agreement that raise concerns about the process that we have right now, which relies, again, mostly on records and documentation kept by a company. Um, I think there's, uh, you know, the regulated party um, had not kept these records, and so it's hard to understand how we can rely on the records when they don't exist. Um, another, another issue that has come up in, in talking with community members is um, the same concern that, that I express, which is that we're relying on a company to provide these records. We have a great example here of a company not even having those records and um, having a pollution issue for 17 plus years uh, where they were above permitted levels by quite a bit. Um, I think it's important to note that Water Gremlin is not an isolated incident. So um, the final shutdown of Northern Metals, another example in North Minneapolis last September, was a result of a whistleblower at the company reporting to PCA that the company was providing false air emissions readings again, relying on a company and having them clearly um, not reporting correct data. Heartland Corn Products in Winthrop, the state's fourth largest ethanol plant. Um, the plant had, been, had not been doing proper performance testing, record keeping, and reporting on the operation and maintenance of its pollution control equipment. This was a Star, Star Tribune article um, from last um, October. Um, new, new management voluntarily conducted an audit and found that violations had been occurring for almost four years. Spectral Alloys in Rosemount. The EPA entered a consent decree with the company in 2012 over violations that occurred between 2004 and 2009, including emissions of dioxins and furans and hydrochloric acid that exceeded federal law and other violations. The company failed to disclose that its own monitoring system revealed excess emissions. 
This was from a Star Tribune article in October of last year. So something important to note in your packet of documents, um, why, why we're looking at stack tests as a, as a potential way of, of actually getting real data, so not relying on records that may or may not be there or records that may or may not be false or records that may have an error. Um, I think one thing to point out is that people do make mistakes in these sorts of situations and it's not always intentional that companies are doing this, but intention, intentional or not, that doesn't change the fact that people are being harmed in our communities because of these emissions. Um, so there's a the document called Clearing the Air, um, an evaluation of Minnesota's programs to protect the air we breathe in your packets, members. Um, it's from 1992 and it talks about um, the PCA's stack test. There's some information in there about number of stack tests um, and percentage observed and you can see on table 6.8, the number has been going down. This was again in the 80s and 90s. Um, and then stack test policy. So some of the information in here, um, which is um, some of the, the guidelines on page 116 um, are what was actually used when we crafted this bill. So it's language that is coming from a report about PCA stack test and um, the new stack test policy that I, for my knowledge has never been implemented, um, but I could be wrong on that. To my knowledge, if it has been implemented, it hasn't been actually being done very widely in terms of um, how many businesses are required to do it. So um, I think the main point here is that we um, don't actually, you, you could go to any company where there's air emissions and we actually don't have a measurement of what's coming out of the stack. We assume that companies are providing us with correct information as we've seen from Water Gremlin and Northern Metals and several other cases, um, some of which I detailed, this is not always the case. And we really have to have some sort of system in place that's actually getting us the data that's helpful in determining whether companies are, um, what they're emitting and at what levels to make sure that they're one, in compliance with permits, but also that they're not causing um, excessive harm to our communities. Very good. Um, so we have, uh, we have a couple of folks to testify. Is that you're, you're done telling us about the bill for now? Yes, I am. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Representative. Um, I have uh, listed to testify um, Greta Gothi again and, and uh, Doug Wetstein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Greta Gothier, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, again, it'll just be me, Mr. Chairman. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to testify on House File 3377. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our goal is to protect and improve the environment and public health, human health, and we are open to any conversation and any legislation to help us better achieve our mission. Um, we did just complete, this, this bill is uh, very uh, encompassing and it would apply to all facilities that have an air permit which would be more than 2,000 entities in the state of Minnesota and would require um, a fairly large staffing increase on the part of the agency. Um, we are not taking a position on this bill because it has budget implications and agencies are not taking budget positions until after the governor's budget is released to the legislature next month. But I will say that we are um, open to continuing to work with the author to see if there are opportunities to scope this bill and um, that's my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Gothier. And, and would the, the increases in, in necessary funding for people, is that, is that because MPCA is gonna be doing more of the testing? I, if, you, if that was said, I missed it, but. Mr. Please. Chairman, yes. We just finished our fiscal note and we had a number, I believe it was over 100 new uh, FTEs and the fiscal note was upwards of 15 million a year. Does, uh, Commissioner, does, does uh, MPCA do any uh, split sampling on any of these now? That, that is the Mr. Chairman, the answer to your question, I'm looking at one of our scientists in the, in the audience. The answer to your question is no. Okay, that, 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 I was wondering what, what level of uh, uh, was being pursued here. So, okay, very good, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and it, I'm sorry, I got, I got some questions. We, okay. Hang on a minute, I, some of them might be for you, Commissioner. 
Um, Representative Lloyd. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess this a question for MPCA. Um, as I was following the authors, uh, some of the uh, justification for this, um, are you comfortable that uh, you're looking at the right things on these permits? Or, I mean, it sounded to me like the agency was really being indicted as absolutely not having a clue what's going on. I'll be quite blunt with you. That's what I heard uh, from the standpoint of uh, are you looking at the right things? Obviously, the company's responsible for to take those measurements. I mean, are, you really feel that we uh, just are missing the boat here and not looking at the right things? I mean, obviously, the ape, that's got nothing to do with the governor's budget. I'm, I'm asking from a more straightforward regulatory uh, question. I mean, Commissioner. Mr. Chairman and Representative Lewick, thank you for that question. I appreciate it. Um, I don't think there is a state agency in existence in the country that is perfect. Um, but I do think that we have a system that many other states also have, which is an option under the Federal Clean Water Act, excuse me, Federal Clean Air Act. It's late in the day, I apologize. Um, which is for uh, a system where um, there, we work with a permittee to set up a system in their facility by which they will meet the um, air quality standards they need to meet. And then that system continues to run and the entity reports back to the agency um, on a self-reporting basis. We are not the only state that has that. Um, but that's never to say that maybe things could be better and we're always open to ideas about ways we might be able to do things better. So we have, I don't think that we are missing everything. I think that sometimes um, Dat we have data submitted to us and we review that data and um, we do make inspections and there are cases uh, where situations like Water Gremlin where these machines are encased in huge, uh, you know, I'm not going to say we didn't do anything wrong, but I'm not going to say we do everything wrong because I don't believe that we do. Um, but we are always open to looking for better ways to do things. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess as a follow-up, Let's just suppose for a moment uh, Minnesota wasn't uh, designated by EPA to, to uh, regulate this element. Uh, would the federal government come in and take those measurements, vice demand that the, uh, the uh, regulated entity provide those measurements? Mr. Chairman and Representative Lewick, yes, if, Min if the MPCA did not have de delegated air pollution enforcement authority delegated from the US EPA, then the US EPA Region 5 out of Chicago would come in and do that work in Minnesota. To put a little finer point on it, would they go in and take the measurements as, as, as this bill would uh, provide, or would they demand that, that as, as you folks do, that uh, you do a certain amount of measuring and that those uh, records are available? Uh, and, and I, I'm not sure at the periodicity, but are sent to uh, MPCA to, uh, to examine. In other words, there's, there's, it looks to me like, and you, you brought the subject up, I know it's not the Finance Committee, but we're talking $15 million and a huge expansion of the agency to go out and be taking measurements and running equipment uh, that it sounds like the industry would normally be doing. So, I mean, <clears throat> Uh, I'm very familiar with the designated, undesignated business from EPA from states where they don't have an MPCA. So what I'm asking is would the federal government uh, do what's in this bill right now? Mr. Go Chairman. Uh, there are a couple, couple folks want to talk on this, so go ahead. And you bet. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask my colleague, um, Assistant Commissioner Craig McDonald, to answer that one. Please introduce yourself and proceed. My name is Craig McDonald. I serve as Assistant Commissioner for Air and Climate Policy at the PCA. Mr. Chair and Representative Lewick, um, the EPA would require the company to come in and to report whatever parameters they decided in that permit process and in that permit and report it to, directly to EPA. Just one quick follow-up then. And also, are, are these... Uh, do these permits, are they renewed every five years or are these some of those that we talked about earlier so that every fifth year 
there is a general review on renewing these permits? Mr. Chair and Representative Lewick, it depends on the permit. So to be specific, um, <clears throat> all permits have reporting requirements, um, but the stringency of the reporting requirement depends on the potential to emit for each permit. So that helps shape what a company has to report. I'm going to go now to Ms. Bailiff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think there may be some confusion over what the bill requires. And I'm reading now from uh, line 2.8 of the bill, which says each air quality per well, my point is that this does not require the PCA to go out and do testing in facilities. What the bill says is each air quality permit issued by the agency must contain a compliance determination protocol that consists of a list of methods the agency requires a permanent facility to employ to physically measure the actual emissions of each pollutant emitted by the permanent facility and the frequency with which the agency requires the permanent facility to employ each method. So the bill states that the, that the facilities are doing the test as directed by PCA. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, Mr. Eliff, thank you for that. I'm still not clear on, on what's going on in the bill. But that being said, um, Ms. Gothier testified, I believe she said that there's about 2,050 permits that are impacted by this bill. So, Representative Wozniak, <coughs> is it your intention that all of those permits all across the state are going to be subjected to what you have in your bill? Mr. Chair, Representative Fabian, I think um, as uh, the commissioner mentioned that we are certainly okay with scoping this if there are facilities that are putting out more hazardous chemicals or larger amounts that that would be something we would take a look at. As it stands right now um, in the bill, um, there are already some guidelines. Um, let me see where that begins. Um, under subdivision four, starting on the bottom of page two, um, there are um, some guidelines around uh, what sort of performance tests are required and how often for different facilities based on certain factors like where they're located, um, what their permit contains. So we are certainly open to if, if scoping that a little bit more, making that a little more specific to facilities that are really putting out large amounts of toxic chemicals or very toxic chemicals, certainly making that a requirement. I think the biggest thing we want to get at is we know these toxic chemicals are out there, but we don't actually measure them. And that's a big concern for folks who are being exposed to these toxic chemicals in their communities. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and Representative Wozniak, you said that you mentioned in your testimony um, northern metals and water gremlin and one other, and you said that these are not isolated incidences. Uh, you also said that there are several other cases where this has happened. Can you give me a list of those other cases that have been? Um, so identified? let me just find that piece of my testimony here. Here it is. Um, so I think the list, let me just find that page here. The list that we have um, has three cases plus water gremlin, um, and those were just in the past several months where there have been press about those beyond water gremlin. Um, so I'm not sure if um, if PCA or someone else could speak to if this is beyond that, but these are just cases that have happened in the last couple of months that we've had media coverage on. President Pig. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Mr. Chair and, and members, I have some concerns about the broad scope of the bill. Uh, there's 2,050, and if I'm hearing you right, there's probably 10 that have um, that probably would fall into that category that you're trying to identify. I just have a lot of trouble with the overreaching uh, nature of the bill. Uh, on page uh, two of the bill, on line 2.29, you talk about a third party under contract. Who would be the third party? Representative Wazner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Fabian. Um, the third party would be in, in the case of, um, for example, with Water Gremlin, they have a laboratory known as WENC that is a third party facility that is doing the monitoring and the testing for, for them as they have this ongoing investigation and, and um, follow up with PCA. So that's an example of, of who the third party could be. It would be somebody who is, um, who is capable and who, who does this sort of work as, as their, their job. 
Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Wozniak, do you have any idea how many of the 2,050 um, permitted facilities uh, are already uh, using a third party to help them with their monitoring and reporting? Mr. Chair and Representative Fabian, I don't know that. Um, a lot of the companies that have permits that are doing this, they generally just do self-reporting themselves. Um, so if it's required, um, if they have any sort of measurements or documentation, those records and documentation are things that, from my understanding, that they're keeping track of and they're providing to the MPCA. Uh, that's enough for now, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative Beck Griffin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I... I mean, the reality is we don't know how many other facilities are breaking the law with their air emissions because we're not checking, which I'm pretty sure is the underlying policy goal of what we're trying to do here. Um, you know, so keeping focused on the policy, the policy is do you let the industry continue to regulate itself and depend on whistleblowers and, uh, you know, <laughs> happening to catch people uh, or them turning themselves in to know whether this is happening. So I think it's, it is a large scope, but we should be concerned about it. Um, and I think what, what we heard from folks in, in our community is that 17 years, how did it take 17 years? Because we weren't monitoring them very closely because they were monitoring themselves. And so I think the, you know, how many can you name off the top of your head? I mean, the reality is we don't know what we don't know. And I think that it's good that we're trying to get to the bottom of that. So um, unless the MPCA wants to answer a question about how many facilities are polluting that you don't know about, um, which I'm guessing you can't answer. So I, I, won't, I won't put you on the spot, but I, uh, that's, that's the thing we're trying to get to here. So thank you. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would agree with uh, Representative Fabian. This is casting a pretty wide net. And just a quick comment on uh, what Representative Becker Finn just said. Um, this bill doesn't change the fact that the permitted facility on line 210 is, is actually the one who is doing the testing. So if anything is changing with that, I'm not so sure it is because they're still the ones that are uh, required to do this determination protocol. And my question to the bill author is that uh, grain elevators and ethanol plants also have air quality permits. And I don't know how we would measure dust in the fall and, and bees wings from corn when they unload that in their, in their bunker for, for a two week period. But would that fall also under the, the authority of, of this legislation if it were to pass? And uh, is, is that the type of thing you're looking at in terms of out in in the uh, rural part of the state, uh, some of the agricultural uh, workings that are going on there. Re Representative Wazowicz. Mr. Chair, Representative Anderson, that's not the intent of this legislation. And I don't, I, again, I don't know specific every single facility or company that falls under these specific um, uh, circumstances that we have listed here. But I would imagine that those would not fall under here just given the fact that it's not the higher levels and the really toxic chemicals. So I can't say for sure if that would fall under this, but certainly not the intent of what we're trying to do. We're really trying to go after large emitters and folks who are emitting very toxic chemicals. Representative Heinken. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think I'm going to piggyback on Representative Anderson's question. I'm trying to figure out, Representative, uh, I was like, what? <laughs> How can, we, how can we move this thing forward if we don't know who it affects? And secondly, I'm still confused, and maybe MPCA can help the second part of this question. I'm hearing that the businesses that are going to be affected by this are still self-reporting. So what are the 100 additional FTEs, if I'm hearing correctly, going to be doing back at MPCA? Mr. Chair and Representative Heinzman, the FTEs have to review the data. Um, so obviously when you have more frequent reporting, we still need somebody to go through that data to check it to determine its validity to see if there's any anomalies with it. That's part of it as well as um, if we do find something, there would be compliance and enforcement staffing as well. Mr. Chair, I can address another piece of that question, Rep Representative Heinzman. Um, so if you look on page 2, line 
Um, this has a third party under contract to a facility operating under an air quality permit issued, blah, 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 um, must report the results. So this third party contractor would be reporting the result, results of the testing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Representative, that wasn't, that wasn't my question. I'm trying to figure out if we don't know who this is going to be affecting, as Representative Anderson was specifically trying, I think, to drive at, how can we be moving this legislation forward? As I thought it was pretty reasonable to try to narrow it out of the agriculture issue, but that couldn't be done, at least in the testimony that I just heard a moment ago. I mean, so if we don't know how it's going to be affecting grain uh, elevators, how can we be moving legislation? I don't understand. Not, not sure there's an answer. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Heinzman, so if you look in under again under subdivision four it's not that we're not narrowing it it's that i can't tell you if a specific company would fall under this requirement i don't have a list in my head of every single company or facility that would fall under this list that would be required to do performance tests thank you mr chair just a comment if it seems like it's pretty reasonable to say that we know this this uh, element of our economy wouldn't be affected or would be we have the bill rate in front of us I don't understand I mean the criteria here can't eliminate that issue as representative Anderson brought up Representative Guineas. well thank you mr. chair um, I appreciate your bringing this bill uh, this is not about protecting polluters it's protecting citizens and this is what we need to do so thank you for doing that when we go on to finance, uh, the Finance Committee, there are a couple of things I'm thinking about that it would be helpful to know. You've given a fairly large fiscal note on this. Isn't there a way, I assume all this is reported by uh, email, and isn't there a program that could be set up to just tag uh, what shouldn't be? And I, I can't imagine there's not a way for science to do that. That's one thing. So to ask that in the next committee. And also, when folks think, oh, this is a big amount of money to spend, I am thinking about the big amount of damage done in the TCE case and would like to be reminded how much was the fine there that really represented the damage done? Mr. Chair and Representative Wagenius, the fine, the civil penalty fine was four and a half million dollars for Water Gremlin. Other um, parameters around the stipulation agreement brought it to about seven million dollars. That would include the SEP and ongoing monitoring costs. Just, but that's one company doing one set of damage. Mr. Chair and Representative Wagenius, that's correct. So if we found just a couple of companies, we would actually maybe be saving money. Mr. Chair, thank you for the comment. Representative Hansen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I have a couple questions for Mr. Eloff, just since we're walking through definitions here. Um, I look at line 1.14, hazardous air pollutant. So the definitions, I think, are defining in terms of the task and with the question um, is uh, is corn chaff uh, considered a hazardous air pollutant Mr. Elif? Mr. Chair, Representative Hansen, I don't believe that it is. <laughs> Mr. Chair, thank you and I'm looking at uh, on line 3.7 a chemical of high concern. So would uh, dust Mr. Elif be considered a chemical of high concern? Mr. Chair, Representative Hansen, no, would not be. And thank you, Mr. Chair. And then even for where there is a emission of a hazardous air pollutant, it has certain, when we go to 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1 that puts conditions on that. Is that correct uh, rep the, to the author of the bill, Representative Wozlick, it It has uh, that uh, the air pollution pollutant has to be in excess of 100 tons per year. Is that correct? So um, it looks like there's fairly common definitions that are involved here uh, relating to the pollutant. Uh, and 
when it has back to 3.7, a facility emits a pollutant identified as a chemical of high concern. So I'm assuming there is a list on 3.8 .8 at the Department of Health of those chemicals of high concern. Is that correct, either uh, Representative Waswick or Mr. Eliff? Mr. Chair, Representative Hanson, yes, that is correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, now I'm more confused um, because on page 2, 2.8, 2.9, 2.10, it says each air quality permit issued by the agency must contain a compliance determination protocol, uh, which seems to me to be not syncing up with kind of the line of questioning or comments that Chair Hansen was making. So my question to the agency is very simple, very straightforward. And Ms. Gothier said that there were about 25, excuse me, 2,050 permits that were impacted by this bill. Does, uh, the way you read the bill, does every permit that's issued an air, per is every facility that's issued an air permit going to be impacted by this bill? Mr. Chair and Representative Fabian, that is the way our staff has read the bill. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. I appreciate the clarification. So then, does that include, say, a hospital or a clinic or a uh, school or a city that have standby generators, for example? Mr. Chair and Representative Fabian, any facility that is required to have an air emissions permit would be subject to portions of this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So my point is, is that we've heard about businesses and businesses, and we like to get after businesses now and then, but this is also going to impact municipalities and hospitals and schools and those as well. Correct? Mr. Chair and Representative Fabian, anyone who holds an air permit would be impacted. Thank you. You put it in here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, it looks uh, just on this line of questioning on 2.8, that each air quality permit requirement is for subdivision to the compliance determination protocol. So that is for determining protocol, whereas the performance tests are not as an inclusive uh, thing because you get into the, the conditions of where they're required under page three. So it looks like we narrow as we go through the bill, that there's protocol that's required and then a smaller subset has the reporting requirements, and then a smaller subset uh, that requires uh, performance tests. If, if that's my correct reading, um, maybe I would ask Mr. Eliff if I'm reading that right, because I want to be uh, at least understanding this as well as uh, Mr. everyone on the committee. Mr. Chair Rep and Representative uh, Hansen, uh, Rep. Hansen, you, you are correct in terms of Subdivision four of the bill, which relates to, t to stack tests, this sets up a schedule as to how often the stack tests will be required by the PCA, and it differs according to the type of facility, whether it's a, a major facility, whether it's putting out hazardous permits or hazardous air, air pollution, um, what its most recent stack test might have uh, shown. Those are going to differ for, for each air facility is going to have a different slot based on their conditions. If they're located in an air non-attainment area, they would be tested more often. Um, but it's also the case that under uh, subdivision two, the determination protocol uh, goes as, as it's drafted now, each air quality uh, permit issued by the agency. So there's two different parts. Um, part one applies to all permittees, the second part depends where those permittees fall within the schedule. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess this question is for MPCA. Uh, is this in any way going to uh, impact the uh, manure management rules in agriculture, uh, specifically uh, uh, in confined operations? Mr. Chair and Representative Lewick, that is not something I'm aware of. Um, we could get back to you on that. So, Mr. Chair, the, the answer is we don't know at this point. Mr. Chair. And that's really a question for the author, not you. 
uh, again, that's a big deal. There's a, there's a uh, whole area out there for manure management uh, uh, with some of the confined operations where we do very carefully uh, monitor and control air and, and uh, odor and all kinds of things. Mr. Chair and Representative Lewick, looking over at our staff, um, it said it would not apply to the manure management. Um, so we got that answer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, to the agency on page 3, um, <coughs> on line, it starts on 3.20, facility whose pollution control equipment has undergone a significant alteration, repair, or replacement. Um, I'm under the impression from the people that I've visited with who do replacement, uh, you have to go through a very extensive permitting process to replace equipment or repair equipment. How would that, um, if, if you have to do that re-permitting in essence, if you're doing new equipment, first clarify for me, do you have to reissue a permit? I've, I've had this situation a few times in the district that I represent. When someone's going to replace or repair their existing air handling equipment, do they need to re-permit? And what is the process involved in that? Mr. Chair and Representative Fabian, it depends on the extent of the um, change being made. There are times where there would be an amendment to the permit, uh, which would be reopened, and that would be a permitting process. Depending on other um, changes to air handling, not knowing specifically what it was, some repairs may not trigger that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And last question. So then, with, because of that process that you have there, uh, on line 3.22, it says that that performance test must be done within 90 days. Is that necessary if you've gone through the other permitting getting up to that point? Mr. Chair and Representative Fabian, I think this gets to the author's intent about when they want that there. Um, obviously, if pollution control equipment needs to be performance tested, um, if we see it as part of opening up the action, we want to see that, and that is a condition of some permits. Thank you. Very good. If I might just comment on that specific piece, Mr. Chair. Um, this is this is largely because of the continued failure of pollution control equipment in Water Gremlin and, and not testing every time and not being able to understand that the pollution control equipment wasn't working correctly and then having this long time, long period where we had the emissions happening. Thank you for that, and I think that's a good point, uh, that this bill's in front of us because we had some bad actors and we need to look at our permitting system and, and the permits are gonna be evaluated and those that need attention will get attention and <laughs> those that don't likely won't, it looks to me like. That's, that's the way it looks to me like it's set up, and I. I date myself, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to say it, it seems to me like we've got a trust but verify going on here. Uh, and, you know, we, we trust folks to do the right thing. If they don't, then we have to do something different to protect human health. So, um, so seeing nobody else on the list here, uh, I'm going to renew my motion that House File 3377 be referred to Environment and Natural Resource Finance. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. No. Aye. Ayes have it. Motion prevails. <laughs>